another session of Come Cloud with us. I'm your host, uh, Abdul Kazi, and I have my co-host, Chris. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Great. Good as always. Um, yeah. Another wonderful Thursday. Getting a little cooler here in upstate New York, so. Yes, I was about to say that as well. Toronto is becoming chillier and chillier. Like this time, it's weird. We were sitting in the 20s, <laughs> Fahrenheit-wise, I would say 80s, but yeah, it's it's been a bizarre uh, fall to say. Fall, that. fall arrived like a, in the last week. It was still it, like I was walking my dog a week ago, and I went out in a black T-shirt and for like a little 15-minute walk, and I'm like, come back perspiring, and I'm like, this is, it felt like summer still. And not not the last week. No, no. And we have Christian uh, Buckley here uh, joining us. So, uh, and jumping we're, right in. <laughs> where are you looking at again? Uh, I am in Lehigh, Utah. So just south. It's the tech hub for uh, Utah. They call it Silicon Slopes. Okay. So you got Microsoft and Oracle. Adobe has a huge campus. Nice. Um, kind of everybody's here. A lot of fintech that's here. Ah, okay. okay. A lot of the old the blockchain was like a huge thing here. So, yeah. Wow. I, nice. I was going to say, I haven't heard that word in a while, my friend. So. <laughs> it's it, because everybody everybody started talking about like the, the AI components of their solution mm -hmm. and less so much about what's happening on the back end with the blockchain. But, you know, I, I think if we're not talking about NFTs and cryptocurrency, that's just fine. Yeah, <laughs> I was never right. on those bandwagons. Blockchain, however, like I still, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of promise in that space. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So and I know, then, like here in you know Rochester, the, the throwback to Kodak. Kodak was very much on that line of like looking into blockchain for imaging, whatever else. It totally made sense. Yeah, and I think Montreal, like especially Montreal, they have. Uh, cheap electric so they have a lot of blockchain and you know people are just like yeah um because of that um but yeah christian so talk to us about your experience um your background how long you've been it uh and what your expertise yeah well if you uh, want to share out my my deck i can drive through that so that i can i can help vis people visualize the uh you know, we'll get back to the title of it but i have in my uh, first slide there, what, what I'm doing. I, I'm doing a lot of stuff. Um, so for those that don't know me, uh, I've been in around the collaboration space. I've been involved with collaboration technology and social technology going back in the, the mid to late uh, 90s. Uh, so for a long time in this space, I've been in tech for 33 years. Um, so you can, all my contact information, the stuff that I'm doing, um, some people know me through different channels, but um, so I've been running, uh, I've got the Collab Talk podcast, which runs, I'm actually going to uh, uh, leverage this recording, this show for this week's uh, episode. Um, I also do a weekly project management uh, uh, live uh, uh, series every Monday morning with uh, fellow Microsoft MVP and, and regional director Sharon Weaver called Project Failure Files, because that's where I started my career as a project manager. And so we kind of go through all the things we we openly share the screw ups that we've done in our careers and talk about those examples. It's a lot of fun. Um, I also do weekly interviews with MVPs, which come out every uh, that's also every Monday published. Um, I do a monthly show with Ragnar Heil and Joy Apple, two fellow MVPs called Guardians of M365 Governance. And we've got an episode going live next week. And then I, I, I have a regular, in fact, we're re recording um, new sessions next week um, called the Microsoft 365 Ask Me Anything or M365 AMA series. That's all out on YouTube and on my blog. And then uh, at the end there, I've been doing tweet jams um, for uh, about 12 years now. Uh, and we've got one that's happening at the end of November on cybersecurity, and there will be a panel live stream after that. That's on the 26th. So if you go follow me on the socials, uh, out on X, for example, you'll see the updates for all that stuff. So, you know, please follow. Is that enough? 
I was just yeah. going to ask, I mean, Christian, when do, you, when do you sleep, my friend? When, when? I don't sleep a whole lot, but I'm also an empty nester, and I, but I'm in the basement, so I don't know what time uh, it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, I guess I should also point out that I am, um, over three years now, I've been blogging daily. So I've I, unbroken. That's what uh, wow. So uh, wow. only because there, I did it on kind of a dare with fellow MVP Tracy Vanderskiff out of South Africa. If you know Tracy, she's awesome yes. human being. Uh, but she did it for two years. So my initial goal was to blog for two years and one week, just to to beat her. Um, <laughs> and then then she said, "I'm thinking about starting it up and doing this again." I'm just like, "Well, I got I can't stop because then she could catch up and surpass me." So I think five years sounds like a nice round number for a goal, but I don't know. I, wow. That is know. impressive. That's I, I'm not making promises there. I'm, yeah. It's like the and Tom Brady that. blogging right here. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can hardly blog now. Like, yeah, I used to blog when I'm like, no. And I know you're kind of talking about the RD stuff. So talk to the audience. Like, what does that mean? People might not know. Like, everybody pretty much knows what MVP is, but talk yeah. to the RD. So what does that mean? The main difference is so an MVP is it's really an award. It's a recognition by Microsoft to per people around the world. And there's like, I don't know what the latest number is like 4,000, 4,500, something like that. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's an award for contributions to the community. The RD program, it's not that at all. It's uh, it's supposed to be a two year stint where we are uh, unpaid advisors and there's, uh, around 200 of us. So it's very limited. It's usually folks that are more senior. Most of us are business owners. We've done multiple, uh, you know, run m multiple companies and different things. We're experts in two or more technology areas for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And so one way to look at us is that we are unpaid advisors to Microsoft. Um, the, the name is misleading. Everybody automatically thinks, oh, you're a, you're, you're, you're a Microsoft employee. Like, no, we, the, the name I think came from like this touchy feely, like, well, we, from a regional basis, we help direct Microsoft on where they should go, which Microsoft regional directors, not a great name, but wow. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it's, it, 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 like we, we ton, sometimes write, um, like we're asked to participate in the creation of white papers and other, uh, reporting and projects that are, uh, you know, never see the light of day out, uh, publicly, but are meant to be, uh, you know, feedback to Microsoft leadership. And so I look at it as, uh, well, it was described to me early on as like, we're basically our, we have a direct path in the, like the top 300 leaders, uh, across Microsoft around the world. And so it's like when RDs, uh, you know, share information or say, hey, Microsoft, you need to be looking at this. They pay attention. Like there, there will be like Jeff Teeper responds directly to RD DLs um, and to issues that are raised by RD. So it's it's uh, it's just it's, it's a cool thing. I'm happy to be part of the program. This is my third two year stint in the program. Oh, wow. Amazing. So. Amazing. That's great. Yeah, yeah, and um, you're mainly on the collaboration side. So, um, talk to us about your expertise there. Collaboration, like, is so big and it's being yes. Like, uh, so, what does that even mean for, for people to understand? Because there's so much buzzwords like Viva and all those kind of things coming up now. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it, it it was so simple back in the days when you say for Microsoft collaboration, there was like SharePoint was the biggest name. I mean, technically, OneDrive, SkyDrive before that was was part of that. Teams is part of that. Um, then Yammer, now Viva Engage is part of that. The Viva Suite is all within that. So, it, you know, when I when I talk about collaboration technology, because my my podcast, my business that I've been doing independent on the side while working for some companies, but has been my primary business for the last uh, more than a decade is the broader theme of collaboration. How do you uh, uh, help two or more people uh, work together more effectively and efficiently? And so that could be you know, the, the, the social collaboration, the document collaboration, information management side of that. I, always, I also look at collaboration as being uh, 
uh, you know, the cultural aspects like of team building, of teams working together, of how do we work in a hybrid model, for example. Um, so my podcast, for example, I, uh, in my intro, I talked about it's the, it's the people, it's the process, and it's the technology around collaborating together. Great. <clears throat> That's great, actually, yeah. And so we'll let you uh, get into your presentation then. Uh, with that being said, we'll sure. get well, it, yeah, and and feel free if there are any questions that pop up, feel free to interrupt me. I've got uh, like I usually do um, when you present on a topic a lot for years. In fact, I've been presenting officially on this topic since the early two thousands. Talking about governance, I used to talk about just broader IT governance, the governance, uh, and then I joined Microsoft from two thousand six to two thousand nine at the launch of Office three sixty five. What is now Office 365, it was MMS and then BPOS and then Office 365, if you know the history of all that. But uh, you know, this is, uh, is a fun topic. It's something, again, that I first got involved with uh, when I worked for the phone company, Pacific Bell, if everybody remembers that, back in California, where I'm born and raised in Northern California, and was tasked with putting together a project management office. As I went and started reading about, uh, you know, corporate governance and IT governance and building PMOs, which I did as a consultant, my first foray into the consulting world is working with companies, um, being hired in again as a full-time employee, employee uh, or a contractor to specifically build out repeatable process to help organizations get better at managing projects, uh, and I, I learned about this, this, these governance principles. And so when you, and I'm going to go through this today, I'm going to like what people are saying, what they're actually mean when they say those things, um, what practical governance kind of looks like some of the Microsoft tools, all of the technical stuff that you expect. Usually when I do a presentation on governance, it's on an aspect of governance and it's more on the technical side. How do we dial in the dials and knobs and switches inside of Microsoft 365? Like that's not what the governance framework is. The framework has nothing to do with technology. Uh, it's, it's what's around the rest of that. And I'll tell you, it's the harder part. It's where most people struggle uh, is with the actual framework. So I'm going to go through some of the, this preamble, very long preamble, very quickly and spend, it's really nine slides at the end going through the actual framework. Um, and this has again been my experience uh, again and again and again over the last you know, three decades practicing this. Uh, so, but if there's any questions, please interrupt. Um, and also uh, you'll notice a theme with the pictures with the AI generated images, which is fantastic. I, I used to pay for all the images so that, that I properly licensed when I used them for stuff and wouldn't get yelled at by somebody online, which has happened um, for using an image that I was not authorized to use. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, there, there's definitely a, a, a look and feel to the AI images in this, this deck. So what are we actually trying to solve here? I was like, start with the definition. Um, what is it? So when people think about it, it's it's a set of policies, procedures, controls that make sure that, you know, are we securely using Microsoft 365? That's that, when people talk governance, that's what that looks like. But here's what people actually say. And I love this as I represent, I've worked with ISVs for most of my Microsoft career. Um, some people might know me. I was the chief evangelist with a couple different product companies. But as I was stand in the expo hall um, like I've been working with, uh, for the last couple of years, Rencor, for example. Um, and I'll come back to products towards the end as well, um, just briefly. Uh, but the questions, the patterns of questions are the same. Whether you're talking about power platform governance or SharePoint governance, or um, we're, we're just trying to get our overall information management systems cleaned up, it's always the same. One. We're spending too much. We need to know how do we spend less. So we're spending too much. I'm concerned with what people can see, what they can access in the system. 
and and I'm just one person and I'm just part time trying to do all of this. So how how can I do all these other things that I should be doing if it's just me, uh, which is a valid question for most organizations. What people actually mean is, you know, how can I reduce my costs? Uh, how do we decrease our level of risk? And then how can we make management of Microsoft 365 more scalable? So, you know, we're so much of Microsoft's messaging is doing more with less, which is fine if you have a plan, if you have a framework for how you're approaching. If you're trying to shoot from the hip, uh, you're trying to, to, to eyeball it and manage all these things, um, even a very small organization, you could be an organization with 10 people and that can quickly get out of hand. In fact, some of the most complex uh, uh, collaboration environments that I've come across have been in smaller organizations that are really leveraging the technology. Because what happens if there's chaos in the system, doesn't matter what size organization you are, then you are going to get less and less efficient in your usage of the tools. Um, so you can have a small, well-managed company that is getting much more value than a large enterprise. So it's size doesn't matter in this case, folks. Uh, so let's talk about some practical governance pieces here. So just very high level, um, looking at like the cost drivers, where you can reduce things. So some of the issues like around licensing. Um, so people that have left the organization, you've offboarded them and yet they remain licensed. Uh, inactive users that are licensed. So uh, uh, you've got external users that you brought them in, you're collaborating on some project, and yet they've not been active in your system for a while, and yet they still have licenses that are out there. Even bigger concern is not the licenses that you might be paying for from inactive users, but the fact that especially external users uh, that have access to sensitive areas that should have only been in there for the life of that project or for 30 days or five days and then removed uh, and then they are not. Over licensing is an issue. Um, run into a lot of organizations that are, don't even realize they, they've now upgraded to E5 licenses and yet they find dozens or some larger organizations, hundreds of users that they're paying for both E3 and E5 and premium, whatever it is. They may be overpaying on licenses, not realizing what they're actually using and need to use. So too many licenses and, and no, Microsoft does not like this line of conversation, like telling people, hey, you're not using, you don't need these additional licenses. You should be paying less, but obviously customers love that. Another other cost drivers around storage. Um, so you're hitting the site storage limits, uh, OneDrive capacity, uh, you got a lot of space that's being being eaten up by SharePoint sites and OneDrives that just need to be cleaned up. Um, we don't we don't properly manage our content, which means that we don't know when it's time to get rid of that content. I, I feel uh, blessed that my first job, salary job. I mean, I've had jobs as a teenager and you know, working summers for hourly. But my first salary job was uh, when I was 19, went to work for a law firm uh, and the I was a runner. And a, a part of my responsibilities were to go in, take files uh, to cold storage, to an offsite storage facility that was, you know, had all the protections in place, uh, Beacon Storage in Sacramento, California, if you're wondering. Uh, and and then at the end of seven or 10 years of case files of closed cases, uh, my job was to go and take the, uh, the material that needed to be then destroyed, um, professionally destroyed to make sure that it was gone, um, not just thrown out in the backyard in a burn pile, uh, but take it to a place where it was shredded and then burned, um, that, that kind of place. Um, but that the purging of that data. And I learned the lesson during that experience working for the law firm is that what happened, because I had one of the partners explain to me, like if we're uh, you know even a week late on the destruction of this, that if there's another lawsuit coming up and they they call for discovery, if we still have those files, even though we shouldn't have them anymore, they should have been destroyed, then they're going to be responsible for 
um, the, providing those from a discovery standpoint. So um, they were very meticulous about uh, uh, making sure that when the life cycle of that content reached its end, that it was taken care of. We need to do that because we're, we're paying too much in space and we're opening ourselves up to risk by not cleaning up our content. And the last one is around consumption. So again, um, you know, understanding why are we paying for these premium connectors that nobody has used or these people have not used? Um, we're creating these flows, we're creating these apps, we're creating these sites, we're creating these teams, all these assets that are not then being used. So it's eating up space. It's potentially utilizing licenses that we don't need. Uh, and then it's opening ourselves up to risk. Like what IP is there? What versions of documents that should be in one place, that single version of the truth that were actually left over in these older, maybe you consolidated and just did go and clean up the, the backside of a consolidation. So a lot of that clutter, cleaning that up. How do we reduce our risk? Um, and, and this is just being aware of what's going on. You, you can't solve a problem if you don't understand what a problem is. So on a regular basis, going through and running an audit, uh, assessing all of your content, your assets, um, review, who has access, internal, external, what permissions, what licenses, all those things. Um, regularly review the, the governance policies. And this is a, a lesson learned too. There's, there's the governance body um, that actually reviews, like think of it from a project management organization, a PMO standpoint, where you're looking at your portfolio of all the various projects that are going on, you're doing your resource management activities. But it's also important to, on a regular basis, and a couple of organizations that I've worked with, we had a quarterly meeting where we were reviewing our governance framework, the process, the meetings, so that we were taking feedback throughout, like every day, every week, every month, but we were constantly refining the model itself. Then the rest of the time we're running the model, we're in it, we're doing things. It's the old palm olive moment. Your hand is in the bowl of of the green goo, uh, you know, I, like you're already soaking in it. Um, I'm just showing you how old I am, that old eighties uh, television commercial. Um, but, you know, but you're, as part of that process, you're reviewing the process itself. And then of course, what Microsoft talks about all the time is you're automating as much as possible so that you're not having to go and manually do those things. And I know it's all the the rage, all the kids are, are going out and creating their, uh, their power automates and their their power apps and and now we've got uh, it, you know copilot agents and all these things that are out there. That's great um, to go and build those things. And I'll come back to the build versus buy. Um, just things that you should think about. Like we can go and create all those things, and then you have to maintain all those things too. So just know what you're signing up for. That's part of what your governance framework should help you do. And Jen, so am I, am I talking at the right speed? Am I okay? Like, I don't want to uh, blow through all this if there's uh, questions or comments that are out there since I don't have visibility in that, but just let me know. Um, so the next question is that, you know, how do we scale uh, what we're trying to accomplish here? And here's, here's my one graphic around, do we build, do we buy? Uh, and look, I've been on both sides of this where it made sense to go in and build a solution. It was cheaper than all of the tools that were being offered. Um, now with, again, with Power Platform, there's so much that you can go in there and automate. If you have people that have the skills, uh, PowerShell, uh, just like you know, Power BI, to go and build dashboards and, and visualizations into your data and get richer insights is fantastic. When you have the people that are able to go and do that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's just something that you need to make a decision on. Is this something that, do we wanna get in the business of building out and then supporting all of these different solutions? And I'm not saying don't use Power Platform to go and automate a lot of those things. I mean, there's, but there are differences in, in differences and decisions that you need to make around whether like, I as an individual or for my team of five people go and build some automation with power apps and workflows um, versus, hey, we're going to build something, a product that we're essentially going to roll out to the entire company. Well, what are the di there are differences there 
Uh, and so just be aware of some of those differences. There are third party tools that do uh, a lot of this from the governance standpoint. I mean, I, I put like probably the four biggest ones up there. There are dozens of other solutions out there. Um, the two that are my favorites as far as uh, ease of use, usability, um, are Orchestry and Rencore um, that do the, everything, uh, all four of these do, a, there's a lot of overlap, but they do a lot of things very differently. Um, but depending on what you're trying to do, there, again, there are tools that are out there. Like it, for uh, setting up your templates, the automating, the provisioning, and from a user standpoint, Orchestry is a fantastic, um, beautifully designed solution. Um, just about everything that Michael Pasarek touches, though, it's, he builds really beautiful products. You know, Michael, fellow MVP. Um, Rencore for ease of use, uh, for the dashboarding and reporting, it's just, it's fantastic. So, you know, but you can go and take a look at the various solutions that are out there. Maybe you already have some in place, um, but that's what it, it comes down to is the build or buy. Would you want to, could you go in and through Power, uh, Power Platform recreate most of what these four products do. Yeah, I mean, technically, yeah. I mean, if if you're able to go in and access the graph and go and build things, sure. But do you want to go and build all of that and then maintain it and support it for your for your company versus, you know, what's your time worth versus the licensing costs of, of a product? All right, where can Microsoft help? And there, of course, around governance, there's a number of things that are out there. This is the highest of high level reviewing each of these things if you're not familiar with them. Um, and the one thing, I, you know, oh, I do have a slide. I, I did add it in. But you have things to go and say, like, why? what's the, the point of the secure store? Uh, it's a secure score. Is it allows you to go in, it monitors some of your progress and makes recommendations, but it's like, it's a it's a good sense of what are we using where are we looking at the overall health and well-being of your tenant your multiple tenants uh, and then what you need to go and take action on for the health of your environment um, purview compliance manager i know there's a lot of things purview of course it was a brand kind of like viva that was put over a host of different products that are now being kind of consolidated in together. Um, but it helps do a lot of the data management uh, across your environment. Um, again, with the third party tools, and we'd always say that like, you still need to go in and use Purview. You still need to, you have Intune, you still need to use, uh, you know, Enter ID, uh, former, formerly known as Azure AD for the profile management, all those sides of things. You still need to use those tools, but then it, the, the Purview doesn't do a lot of what the third-party tools do um, or the Power Platform solutions. So just, again, understand the differences between them. Of course, you've got reporting and capabilities. This is where you, you know, can hit the switches, turn the knobs, make all the adjustments, what you're using, building higher level policies. Um, you can do all of that through the admin center. And then of course you've got like Microsoft Defender, which on the security side of it going in there. And um, you know, Microsoft is doing a much better job at quickly going and creating the admin center experience and centralizing around the capabilities. The problem is that there's, you know, what is it now? 14, 15 admin centers, if you're using everything kind of in the family of solutions. It's just a lot to get your head around. So whether you're using the out of the box capabilities, you're building solutions, or you are going to try to, uh, you're buying third party tools to help you with all those things. It's that's, that's all great. Um, but you still need to have a governance strategy and a framework in place. And so that's where I'm gonna kind of get into this. So a um, couple things around strategy, what goes into governance strategy. So there's a lot of things here. Um, so knowing what you're trying to accomplish, where your pain points are, um, you know, all of that, uh, the, un identifying all of the important stakeholders as you're going and you know serving your internal needs, um, having a framework in place, conducting that data inventory, understanding what the systems are, what's out there, having a 
process in place to triage issues as they come on, uh, they come up to prioritize those things, automating where you can, having training and support, of course, is so critical. You can't just assume that, hey, people know how to use Microsoft Office, the productivity tools. Um, that's not enough. Uh, you need to have ongoing training and support. Uh, and then making sure that you are in alignment with what you're building out, what you're doing um, with what the business is trying to achieve. That's a big part of what governance is, is you have the current state of your systems, of your data, of your users. You have this vision of a future state, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and governance is a lot of filling the gaps to get you from A to B. Um, addressing missing features, capabilities, monitoring, the compliance, the policies, the guardrails, um, you know, the, the various uh, uh, standards that you need to meet per industry, per your region, per whatever. Um, and then identifying the right metrics to measure all those things and then regularly reviewing and updating that framework. So this is a very high level of a broader governance strategy. I will go through that in a little more detail around that. I, I am also a big fan of the Microsoft maturity model. Um, and this uh, goes back, if, if some of you might know some of the history of the maturity model, it goes back to um, uh, Sadie Van, Van Buren, who created this um, back in oh, 2010. It was the 2010, SharePoint 2010 era, but it was initially the SharePoint uh, maturity model uh, and it's evolved. It, it's now a community effort. It's It's got a panel. I work very closely with Sharon Weaver, who's is part of that, that panel. So we talk a lot about this. Um, but one of the things that I always advise companies is to go in, be familiar with the maturity model and use that to get a better sense of where they are today. Because the, one of the biggest questions to answer is, uh, or I guess the biggest question that's asked is like, where do I start with all of this? And, and just a little secret here is that uh, rarely, if ever, uh, is there the, a true uh, greenfield environment where we've not done anything yet. So we've not done anything wrong. Let's go put all of the policies and structures and framework and all those things in place so that as we move forward, everything is perfect and well-managed. Like I'll argue that that scenario doesn't exist. The reality is that um, we we signed up for the company signed up for uh, you know got everybody uh, laptops. We have Microsoft 365 licenses. Um, people are coming from backgrounds where they're familiar with just the Office productivity suite. Um, they're you know Word and PowerPoint and Excel, and the rest of it is is all. Uh, you know, uh, relatively new, they're untrained on that. And so they'll go in and use, uh, you know, what they're comfortable with. Great example of this is in teams. And so uh, in, in teams where there's a serious problem is that people understand the chat capability, but they're using chat instead of using channels for conversations, for sharing content. And so what's happening is that they're recreating the wheel. They're sharing and resharing, uh, you know, content that should live, you know, in one place and then be shared out from that version. But it's almost like we've recreated the problems with spamming everybody with email now over in the chat side of things. So uh, understanding from the maturity model is you get a better sense of going through each of the categories of each of the areas around communication, around information life cycle, uh, you know, kind of e each of those classifications to understand, hey, we might be a, you know, one to 500 level. We might be a 100 level in our information management, how we, you know, the manage the life cycle of our content, but we're at a 300 in our communication. We're really strong at that level. There's no right or wrong answers. And your goal is not, hey, we need to be 500 across the board. Like, again, I don't think there's any company in the world that's at 500 in every category across the board. Um, and whether that should even be a goal for somebody to, to, to do, um, that's something that should be personalized. But when you know that you're lacking in certain areas to have a 
solid understanding of where you are across these industry standards and then have a clear idea of for us to mature this we know we're weak in in communications we know we're we're weak in our information life cycle our classification of data kind of those other the core aspects of governance um we can now see where the next steps are uh, so that that's a great that's that's my pitch i'll end there on the maturity model um, you can spend a lot of time uh, getting involved with that. There are monthly calls for that uh, community group. Uh, it was kind of a split out. I don't know if it was part of the patterns and practices organization or whoever manages these community efforts, but um, it's all after you go and do a search for M365 maturity model. You'll see the, the panelists, the Microsoft and community people that are involved with that. And there is an opportunity for anyone to get involved if that's something you're interested in doing. All right, so let's get into the actual governance framework. Uh, so this is the meat portion of the Thanksgiving meal here, everyone. Um, so first and foremost with your governance strategy is to, or with the, sorry, with the framework, I don't wanna loosely use like the strategy versus the actual framework. Um, the difference between the two is like, here, there's the goals, the framework is, here is our structured approach to solving problems around governance. Here is our repeatable pattern and not everything will always apply in every instance, um, but it, it's, it's like going back to the rule book. Like how do we handle this scenario? Oh, hey, this is how we do this thing. Um, so it's to first and foremost to have that purpose and scope. So talk about what it is, why, why it's important, what the value is to your business. You can even have like a, a statement of like, here's why we're going to do it. We're going to make sure that we are, you know, we're meeting these standards and then specify the scope of that, of what's covered. So talk about the specific tools. You could get into um, specific business objectives or business areas. Um, and so you might have a level higher of specificity around your finance and accounting teams versus your project management teams versus engineering, for example. Um, so that goes through and talks about kind of all the components that are covered by this framework. Um, second is to have clear roles and responsibilities. And this is all about you know, overall accountability. If you don't have this defined, um, like I don't have it here, but you've got the, the governance team, you know, each of the different business units, for example, you should also have your executive, uh, uh, you know, sponsor for, for this, this effort so that there is uh, clear lines of ownership so that if somebody has a question, they're having an issue, it's a governance problem. They need to know who do I go to in my department to make sure that this is brought up in the next governance discussion, which might be happening weekly or twice a month or monthly, I would not go any uh, further than that. I would at least monthly, quarterly is not often enough um, to go through and review these things. Um, but to identify those people, to have the responsibilities uh, you know, assigned out there so that you know that people can have their areas of focus, their areas of concern. Um, you have that documented. So again, you might have multiple representatives from one side of the business, but one might be technical issues. The other one be business and financial issues. Um, so if you, the more that you can clarify that and, and recognize people's time in those roles um, for the business, um, that is something that is also critical here. And then have that decision-making authority. And this is, this is something that's critical. Like when I was, uh, a couple times this has happened, but in past organizations, um, I'll, I'll use this example from, um, I worked for a DSL provider, uh, is that part of it was setting up who had decision-making responsibility for each of these departments. And we said, hey, if you're unable to make one of our uh, regular meetings and we were meeting every other week, um, then you need to say, send somebody that has the ability to make a decision. And a couple of times uh, somebody was busy. So they sent somebody junior to the, the meeting and a decision needed to be made. And they were unwilling to sign off on something uh, because they didn't feel that they had the authority or it wasn't clear, or they 
did not have the authority to make that decision. And so a decision was not made and a delay happened to the project. And so the person that didn't show up for that meeting was furious that his project was delayed. And we went back to the founding governance documents, this framework and said, you signed off on this. You knew that the person you sent was not comfortable with making that decision. You should have been at that, that meeting if you, you know, around this issue. Anyway, the long story short is, uh, have people with the ability to say yay or nay to a decision if they're going to represent you within that. So that was something that was a critical part of the roles and responsibilities. This is all very, as you see now, very project management, uh, uh, you know, project management esque. Uh, it has that flavor, um, which is a lot of where this comes from. Uh, and it's funny when I, I, I tell this story all the time, but when I started as a consultant, left the phone company, uh, was working with a couple different companies, uh, and before I went to a, a, a VC funded startup, but I had a, a binder, this massive binder, three ring binder that had all of my templates, that had all of my, the, the framework, the outline for all of these different pieces. And I would go into these places and, and I would, again, it was, I was able to follow it to the letter. I mean, literally follow it to the letter in this the written form and utilize those components that made sense for each organization that I, that I went to. And that's what you're doing here. Um, then you have the next step is developing the policies and standards. And so this is where you have, you know, very specific policies around it, depending on your industry. Um, you've got best practices out there per industry, best practices for, depending on the tools that you're talking about for management of SharePoint and all the data, which of course drives so much of uh, you know, everything behind Microsoft 365. Uh, it's funny now with all of the co-pilot discussions and people are recognizing that governance is an important topic for deploying co-pilot. I'm like, yes, because Copilot, similar to when Delve was released, um, Copilot has people that are suddenly seeing content that they say, well, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be able to see this content. It's what it's doing is it's uncovering security through obscurity. Um, you had, you know, improperly classified, uh, improperly stored content that's now being surfaced through Copilot meaning I, you need to go and clean up your content on the back end before you're deploying Copilot. So understanding your data protection and compliance, the, the rules that you must adhere to, the compliance and security standards, um, other collaboration and sharing guidelines, uh, best practices that are out there, your retention and archiving policies, all of those things define what those are know what you know, legally that you need to do, that responsibly you need to do, have all of those pieces uh, defined so that you're not guessing. And then the, that allows people when they're collaborating in the environment, they're not having to worry about those things because the system was built with the guardrails in place. That's what governance does is make sure that the guardrails are adhered to. So then you're spending your time instead of putting out massive fires because you forgot some piece. It's more exception management. It's, you know, seeing we see a new pattern, a new set of behaviors from users of them doing something that, you know, it's adhering to the rules, the policies that you put in place. But, and I, as I always say that people are like, uh, you know, water running down a hill. You put a rock in front of them, you put a rule, a policy in front of them, and they will go around that and continue rolling down the hill. People want to get their work done, um, but people also understand and will work with the policies. But it's human nature that we will then look to optimize our efficiency. This is my nice way of putting it. Uh, around those rules, I want to get the most work done at the highest quality as fast as I can, get my work done. Uh, and so it may not always be the best way. The governance body, part of the constant review is then looking at, I see now users that are in this department are doing this activity and that actually, uh, it follows the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. We need to adjust our metrics 
adjust the guardrails to stop that behavior and redirect them, retrain them on, here's the proper way to go and do this thing. It's like, here's an example of that, if this is confusing, uh, is that when you lock down external collaboration, what do people do? Uh, they attach large files to emails. So you've locked down your environment to be more secure and then people do a less secure thing as they email out your intellectual property or worse, they share it via, uh, you know, a Dropbox or box or some other third party tool that is not officially supported. They have no visibility into it. What happens if they've shared a bunch of, they've transferred content to a, a personal location or a personal OneDrive, even then, uh, and they've shared that out there. They then leave the company. You have no visibility into what files they still have, what IP is floating out there. Um, so the answer is not to go and slap their hand and lock down more of the system. It's to redirect. It's to educate them on here's the proper way to do that. And in some cases, um, under better understand what people are trying to do to get their work done uh, and adjusting those guardrails to allow them to work the way that they need to work. And that's part of the role of the governance framework. If you're meeting weekly, bi-weekly, bi-monthly, never knew the difference between bi-weekly, bi-monthly, twice a month, folks, or monthly, uh, if you know, that you're having these conversations, you're looking at these patterns and you're making adjustments to your guardrails. But you have to, you start by defining those policies and standards. Next is that you have a change management strategy. So a way for like, we have this policy here. This is the rule. This is the policy. Somebody says, look, I'm being, I'm not able to get my work done. You have to have a change request process in place. Now there's part of that. There could be a formal impact analysis, depending on what the request is. Um, it doesn't need to be that formal. At the very least, you have feedback mechanisms, multiple ways of doing that. Here's some examples of that. Like we, we all know the, like the uh, uh, anonymous feedback that you can drop in in the lunchroom, uh, a note of, you know, I'd like to see this changed. You can have a version of that, create a power app that has it out on the site that, uh, you know, anonymizes the data, the input, so people can feel, not feel threatened by sharing feedback, positive or negative around that. But also do town halls, do uh, AMAs, um, do one-on-one -on -one interviews with key stakeholders on a regular basis because you could be sitting in a town hall, somebody won't raise their hand, you could, you know, they don't anonymously add that, but you go sit behind a closed door and have a one-on-one -on -one with this key stakeholder and suddenly uncover a bunch of issues or questions or ideas that they have. So you need to have multiple feedback mechanisms in place as part of your model. And then of course, ongoing training and awareness. And so this might be formal classroom training. This might be, uh, you know, uh, uh, live and on-demand training of, uh, you know, of, of capabilities when you're seeing a certain volume of support issues or questions that are coming in, um, search queries on the site, all of which can inform you like, hey, we've got this training, um, but we're obviously weak in these areas and then reinforce for everybody um, on this, this training area. Um, so that's, there's a lot of ways to do that. I was always a, a, a big fan of having people in the organization share kind of a, a, a sack lunch presentation of like literally people sitting around a conference room uh, while they're eating their lunches with somebody sharing, here's what I went in and built. Um, here's what I ran into. This is a change that we made because of it. Here's what we learned from that experience so that, uh, you know, there, it doesn't have to be a perfect solution that they built or something that you've done, but it's a way of, you know, in a, a low threat environment, allowing people to ask questions, to learn more about what you've built, what you've put in place and, uh, and share their thoughts around that, that solution. Having a communication plan uh, is, is critical. So uh, you have, this is something at the beginning of this process and, and follow this, like having an internal monthly newsletter, having a 
team that is set up, channels that are designated for specific areas, having a front door process to escalate issues uh, and bring them to a, a, a people's attention and to have transparency over all of that. One of the most frustrating parts of having feedback where uh, like I can't get my job done because this policy, this stupid policy is not allowing me to go in and do what I need to do to get my job done. I put in a change request saying say, if we had this, if we only did this, this thing, and that it never is acknowledged, you never see any updates on that, you're completely stymied by your work. This is where, uh, uh, you know, rogue IT, that phrase comes from. People will go around IT, go around the process if they, they don't feel heard or if they if change never happens. So the transparency is part of this where you have to make this visible. Like we heard this, uh, you know, this, this feedback and here's where we are. Um, and, and, you know, th this is what we're going to do. We're going to take action on it. And I'll, I'll tell you, having run this so many different times over the last 30 years, even if your feedback is, we heard this feedback, look, this is why we're doing it the way that we're doing it. So we will not make this change. This was intentional the way that we're doing it. And here's why. People are more accepting of that response than a non-response. They are more likely to change their behavior if they are heard and it's explained the reasoning behind that before taking that next step. And how are we doing on time, Chris? Okay, all right. I got just a couple more here. Um, establishing, of course, monitoring and reporting mechanisms. Um, I'm always a, a big fan of the centralized dashboard. I've got lots of stories to tell about um, having dashboards that no one ever looked at. And so we resorted then to pushing out emails with personalized versions of reports to executives. And uh, just, it was fantastic. One of my favorite stories is this director that finally came back and like, you know, these emails have been fantastic. What I would love to see is if this was just in a centralized dashboard where I could go to the same place every week. And I, I didn't say, hey, it already exists, you idiot, which I felt <laughs> like saying. Um, instead, I said, that's a great idea. And like two days later, I messaged her and said, hey, we've got this dashboard. You go take a look at it. Like, brilliant. We make, we did no extra work. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. Um, but again, that you're regularly auditing, you're talking to people on the ground, you're talking to your stakeholders and making sure that you're kind of auditing your own process. It's critical to do that continually. And then of course, as I mentioned a couple of times, that regular review um, it's part of the continuous improvement. It's not just looking at the projects that you're working on, the problems with the systems, but looking at the overall framework. Is it meeting our goals? Is it meeting our needs? Do people feel like they're being heard? They have a voice in the process. And I always say this is a Buckleyism, but the more you involve people in the process, the more likely they will support the process. So the more transparent you can make this, and have that feedback and iteration and share where you've changed, where you've updated. People are more accepting of that process. And the last part of all of this is that you're going through doing the risk management and contingency planning. You're constantly looking at not what's gone wrong, but you're, it, when you have the framework in place, it allows you to then go have, to look forward and say, okay, this is a potential risk in this situation. Have a plan. If this happens, here's what we will go and do. You don't have that luxury if you're trying to catch up constantly. And then all of this, you're changing the culture. Um, so much of this about, and I'm going to spend the least time on this slide, but the culture, cultural aspect of all of this is the biggest part. If you can make this governance uh, uh, approach, part of the culture of your organization, it will solve so many problems before they become problems. Um, then my last slide here is like, there's no possible way I could do all of that by myself. <laughs> and so that's where I will say that, uh, you know, as a, a consultant, so I partner with uh, Smarter Consulting, but we actually have where we help organizations, we've got three products of 
uh, we actually can run a governance assessment for you um, with the governance tune-up, which has an assessment, which we actually go and make sure that your existing platforms are industry standard, like fine-tuned. And then we have our co-pilot readiness, which does both of the first two things, but then with, of course, the rest of the co-pilot readiness and training and getting people to kind of switch over to that technology. So if anybody is interested in that, we've got a free 30-minute consultation we do. Um, there's That's out there. Um, please take a look at it, smarter-consulting.com. And, and so I, I run the, as so I partner with them and I run the, the governance practice over for Smarter Consulting. So I don't know, there, did I miss any questions? I know there's a couple comments, but I've got it on my middle screen. I don't see it so well, but. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've had no questions yet, but it's a good reminder. Um, I've been kind of hitting the comments back and forth. Um, but yeah, if any of our viewers, you have any questions, now is the time we got three of some of the best brains in the business here. So, <laughs> but Christian, great stuff. This is fantastic. I know well, a hey, lot of this resonated with, with me personally. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, it's one of those topics. Like we've all lived through so many aspects of this. I mean, it's been a bigger part of my career than I ever thought it would. It was one of those things where I was doing it out of necessity because I inherited a, you know, initially like a hot mess. And so I started then reading more about it and getting into this, this side of things. And, but it's yeah. one of those things. It's, it's like when you ask an MVP whether they have enough contacts inside Microsoft. Oh, I know a lot of people inside Microsoft. Yeah, but roles change all the time. People leave and, and join. You never know enough people. You know, and, and it governs the same thing. Like you, We all have experience with being responsible for some aspect of it. But few people have gone through and end to end built out the framework um, and to do to do this, uh, and and so that's it, it. It's all right if you feel like you need help. There's a lot of people that are great voices that are out there, especially the MVP community. Um, you've got people like Sue Hanley and Richard Harbridge and uh, Dave Drever and uh, and Joanna Klein and and just a, a bunch of other voices that are fantastic at this. And I would put Sharon and I in that category as well. But <laughs> lots of people that you can ask if you're looking for help. And I was, I, I know I always lead that way too, just a, a little add on to it, but you know, uh, we need help too. You know, we, we tend to break, break things. That's really the only way we learn. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's all that's how muscles are built. Crazy, you, 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 know. you tear down the muscle for it to build up. Yup. It, it sounds like my week. This is a little bit of a sore spot. Christian, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, how we, that's how we learn. I mean, Batman learned that. Yep. What, what do we do when we fall down? We get yeah. back up. Yep. So. Resiliency. Yeah. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions. So, um, Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is great. Uh, so I guess a lot of I have question about uh, frameworks, you know, Christian, uh, the challenge, big challenge is about culture, right? You kind of touched about the culture thing. Um, and every company is different from enterprise to SMB. Like, like, talk to us about that aspect, because that's, I think that's the biggest piece, right? The culture, like, and how do you define that? How do you even capture that when you're doing the framework? Yeah, it's, I mean, think about it, like if, if we're working at like a little 10 person organization, as I mentioned, uh, like that you could still have a fairly robust and complex collaboration environment. You could still be using the full suite of tools, premium licenses, all those different things. And, and so a lot of the guardrails need to be in place, even if you're not, you know, terabytes of new content created monthly, like larger enterprises, um, it's still a lot. And that the longer that you go without having, you know, process in place and having those basic components in place, the more risk you open yourself up to. Um, and, and so e even when you're small, you can follow kind of the best practices for putting a framework in place. And you may just say, Hey, right now this doesn't apply, but we've answered that. We've asked the questions doesn't apply now. And as you go through over time, as the organization grows, you're now 25 people, 
they'll stop being NA. They will start being, you know, not applicable. They will start applying and be like, all right, let's go now answer this question. And if you are at least on a quarterly basis going back and reviewing your framework, you're going to see that change, that evolution over time where you're like, hey, we're at the point now, we've got enough content. We need to expand our information architecture, our classification. We need to start using sensitivity labels because we're adopting the co-pilot stuff and we're, we're gonna hire this new team. We can't have access to this other area. We need to make put this in place now and expand that out. So it is something that it's a constantly reviewed, optimized, um, and, and, you know, iterated path. And it's, it's, I mean, the, the biggest struggle people have with it is like, I don't have time for, I'm trying to get work done. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, oh, all right. It's the same people that they're like, okay, we don't need testers because we're going to go build it right the first time. So we don't need to have somebody test it at the end. So I love that joke is just like, I, if I had written the code, I wouldn't have written that bug into it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and the other biggest issue for me, like I work in with enterprise customers, you know, compliance and based on compliance, you know, the, these frameworks come in. And I think that's the biggest resistance we get from um, the end users. They're like, nope. I'm like, yeah, you have to abide by the compliance. If there's nothing we can do about it. So, if you ever, if you ever have run um, especially like financial audits, uh, like on the IT side of things, like I've done that for mm -hmm. customers. I was flown in from out of state, out of state, worked with a very large uh, uh, company. Um, at the the time I, I joined, I worked with them for a year, and in the year I worked with them, they went from about uh, they were about four hundred million in revenue. In the year, they jumped up to double that, wow. just over eight hundred million. Yeah, they were one of the fastest to a billion dollar companies in U.S. history, and they were getting fined daily sure. for financial uh, uh, compliance, yeah. problems. Yeah, so I was brought in to fix that, and a lot of that was retraining and auditing that system, and people lost their jobs because they failed to adhere to their new training and went back into their old habits. And I'll tell you, after two people lose their job, um, the rest of the team suddenly remembers what they learned in that class that they took Ooh, for a week. Light bulb moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I mean, it, it's it. I felt bad, but you know, it was uh, the the fines they were getting on a monthly basis exceeded the salaries of the people that got laid off. So. Yeah, that makes sense. yeah, that actually happens. Yeah. Yeah. So have, having the process in place and reviewing that and adjusting, I mean, it's just, it helps you solve those problems. It helps you. I know this, I'll use another project management speak, you know, get another keyword of it, but it helps you mitigate problems The the, I mean, this is like known generic project management stuff, but when the, the sooner you can identify a problem and mitigate it, the, le the less it, expensive it is to fix. The longer that it goes, the more expensive it becomes to fix. And so all this framework allows you to be at the front of that and identify and fix problems that could potentially down the road be very expensive. That's why you have governance in place. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions though. Um, uh, Chris, any other? Yeah, it's been a quiet crew. But... <laughs> well, I appreciate, um, uh, Cricket's response. Like what's going on here? Yeah, really. <laughs> In general. <laughs> exactly. I saw that. I was going to say, I didn't really ignore it, but yeah, there, but, you know, I don't, know what, point, I don't it. know what point that was asked, but that's, uh, I asked it was that pretty early on. I asked that multiple times during the day, just in general as well. So. <laughs> so that, that being said, maybe uh, we can wrap it up. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think so. Let's do it. So, Christian, again, thank you. This is awesome. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Tuned in. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hopefully, everyone tuned in. Um, 
got at least a couple of tips out of this. I know, you know, I did this bunch of stuff that I can take back to my organization and the other folks that I work with when I get these questions. So thank you for that. Um, Tool, thank you as always for being the partner in crime co-host here. And uh, thank you to our viewers. So again, if you like this content or love it, um, please subscribe to all of us. Uh, I know Christian's got his own stuff going on, but, you know, come cloud with us. Um, it's like subscribe, continue to follow us. Let's continue to grow this community. So thank you all and uh, have a great night or a great morning, great evening, wherever you may be. And Thanks a we'll lot. See you next time. Take care. Thanks, Harvey. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening. Thank you.